Hi everyone, today I'm in Vanier Park in Vancouver, British Columbia, and this funny looking building behind me is the Vancouver Maritime Museum. Let's go check it out. There's a very good reason that the building's shaped this way. One of the museum's featured exhibits is a full-size historic sailing ship. Behind me is the actual sailing vessel, the St. Roche, which was the first vessel to complete the Northwest Passage from west to east. The St. Roche is a Royal Canadian Mounted Police schooner, which is famous for being the first ship to completely circumnavigate North America, and just the second vessel to ever navigate the Northwest Passage. The ship was constructed in 1928 in North Vancouver before it was shipped out to patrol Canada's Arctic. It's made mainly of thick Douglas fir with Australian eucalyptus known as ironbark on the outside, and the interior is reinforced with heavy beam to withstand the pressure of Arctic ice. The ship acted as a floating detachment of the RCMP, serving as a supply ship, a patrol vessel, and a transport linking the scattered communities in Canada's north. But it was the Nazi occupation of Greenland during the Second World War that triggered the St. Roche to go on its most famous voyage. It set out on a secret mission to cross the Arctic, traveling through the treacherous waters and uncharted territories of the Northwest Passage. Then in 1950, the vessel became the first to circumnavigate North America, traveling from Halifax, Nova Scotia, all the way to Vancouver via the Panama Canal. By 1954, the ship was decommissioned and returned to Vancouver, finding a permanent home here on public display at the Vancouver Maritime Museum. Designated a National Historic Site of Canada, the St. Roche still inspires the imagination of children and adults who wonder at its tales from the early days of Arctic exploration. A diagram of the St. Roche. Let's head down to the cabins below. Ooh, those are some pretty steep steps. Very tight quarters in here. Some crew bunks. Not a lot of space whatsoever. And I guess just enough to sleep. An old stove for heat, which I guess is important when you're navigating the Northwest Passage. And here's a bronze statue of the captain, Henry A. Larson. Let's take a look at the captain's quarters. Downright luxurious compared to the crew cabins. A library and reading room. This was a study area. Here's the cabin of the wireless operator. You can see he's got his equipment right in his room there to be at the ready 24 hours a day. There's the kitchen. This is where all the meals would have been prepared. Can't imagine how difficult it would have been trying to cook meals on a moving ship like that. In the dining area, with the table sectioned off. This was known as the fiddle, and they used this grid pattern to keep dishes from sliding off the table in rough weather. And this was the residence of Joe Panapakuchu, who was an Inuit guide and hunter who came aboard with the family of seven people, plus 17 sled dogs. Can you imagine a family of seven people living in this tiny tent? It said the whole family lived in this tent for over a month. The ship is always a highlight when visiting the Maritime Museum, but let's check out some of the other exhibits on site. And this exhibit explores the history of the HMCS Vancouver, a corvette which was commissioned in 1941 and served in World War II. This painting, commissioned in 1919, shows a World War II British destroyer similar to the HMCS Vancouver death charging a German U boat. The emblem of the HMCS Vancouver? And this exhibit shows some relics from the early divers who explored the depths of the ocean. 
Unlike today's scuba gear, these divers wore heavy, bulky outfits, which were connected to the surface by an air supply hose. And here's one of the old fashioned pumps that would have fed air down to the divers. Some of the heavy boots that the divers would have worn to keep them walking firmly on the bottom. And over here it says to communicate, a pair of speakers were fitted within the diver's cap and a microphone was placed near the front window. This section talks about the different lighthouses used for navigation. It says this lens was once stationed in a lighthouse at the south end of Quadra Island. It sat on top of an 18 meter tower and was built in 1915. And this giant piece is a searchlight that was originally located on the Sudbury 2. The museum also has a collection of miniature ships, many of which have local or historic significance. One of these models is of the RMS Empress of Japan, also known as the Queen of Pacific, an ocean liner built in 1890. During her career, the Empress of Japan made 315 Pacific crossings between Canada and the Far East, traveling a total distance of 4 million kilometers. During the First World War, she served as an armed merchant cruiser and remained in service until 1922. Upon retirement, her famous dragon-shaped figurehead was put on display on the Stanley Park seawall. But in 1960, it was replaced with a fiberglass replica, and the original was moved here to the Vancouver Maritime Museum as part of its permanent collection. One of the current exhibits, the museum is celebrating canoe cultures. It says that Canoe Cultures is an Indigenous-led organization dedicated to the art and culture of the canoe, promoting Indigenous voices through artistic expression. Canoes are an integral part of the Indigenous culture here on the West Coast, celebrated by our First Peoples as more than transportation, but as an art form that's foundational to their traditional way of life. For this exhibit, visual and performing artists have been invited to join the program and create works that explore the importance of the canoe in the Indigenous identity. And here are some of the tools that are used in the carving of those canoes. Outside, you can see the Picard Grumman PX-15, known as the Benjamin Franklin. This is an oceanic research submersible built in 1969 and made the world's longest research dive when it drifted for 30 days in the Gulf Stream. Thanks for joining today. Hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Canada's maritime history. Remember to keep exploring, and until next time, it's time to exit through the gift shop.